Well, for those of you who, uh, thank you for that. I can certainly respond to you. Uh, how did I end up in a servant's room in my mother's boarding house, tatty little boarding house in Port Elizabeth, uh, just off Main Street? Uh, you know, half the ladies of the night lived in our boarding house, the prostitutes, because we do a seaport. There are a lot of sailors there looking for a good time at night. Mm. And um, how did I end up in there? Well, I see, I had a huge problem. I had a huge problem. And my problem was one that <coughs> maybe some of you even have got. I had a powerful and magnificent mother, an Afrikaans woman, Port Gieter, from Middleburg Cape. Um, almost illiterate. Almost illiterate when letters had to be written to the cred to the people we owed money to because we didn't have any money to pay and etc. You know the sort of trouble you're landing in financially. My mother couldn't write the letters. Nine, ten year old Harold Apple Lanigan Fugard, which is my full name, used to have to sit there with a pencil and a piece of paper and she'd say, Halley, tell him that we we, we we've had a bad time and da 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 and I would have to write Oh, come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, my father was an alcoholic. Now the problem was, he wasn't. It wasn't easy to hate him, because he was a gentleman. He was a lovely man. He was a good man, full of prejudice. My mother, struggling because she knew something was wrong in the country looking around and then sharing with me, because I was the closest of three children, that there is something wrong. Something is, there are poor people, look at them coming into the shop to ask for a jam tin of tea and coffee and half a loaf of brown bread with nothing in their pockets and when we put it on the book. You know, she knew that something was wrong, so she was in the process of opening, of growing. My father was closing down. Alcoholic, a cripple, that is why, you know, my mother was the breadwinner in the family. Now, you know, any boy needs a role model. Any woman needs a role model. Any young girl. I needed a role model. I needed a man who I could look up to and say, that's who I want to be. The man who I wanted to be was black. Sam. Sam Samila, the black servant who worked for the family. Upright, good, clean, decent, everything I wanted my father to be, but wasn't. And in South Africa, to have a surrogate black man as your, your black man as your father, I, 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 I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. And that is why coming out of that internal conflict, you know the play, coming out of that internal conflict about what I must love and what I must hate and, and what the country, what, what they're doing, what the world is trying to do to my head, when there was a crisis and what nine, ten-year-old boy can cope with some of the things that life can throw at him. And I couldn't, so I spat in Sam's face. He transgressed. He forgot that I, nine-year-old Harold Ethel Lanigan Fugard, was Master Harold, and in future you call me that, Sam. You call me Master Harold and the boys. So there. Does that answer your question? Good. Nice question. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, Master Harold is actually one of my favorite plays as well. But um, my question to you is, how did you then make that sort of journey or transition from, you know, your upbringing and your love for theatre, secondly, and actually writing, you know, anti-apartheid um, plays? How did you make that transition from Port Elizabeth to the now? You know... Uh, it's the first question I can't answer. 
Uh, no, not necessarily, because I myself, now, I'm very honest about myself, and I'm not going to be anything less than honest with you all this afternoon, is that I'm not a brave man, I'm not a strong man. I can't believe that's so, to write during that time. And well, I, well, now, this is the problem, I just couldn't, I, I had to, you see, I understand? Yeah. But I was scared all the time. I was scared. Mm. And you know, I would have made a lot of people happy if I'd shut up, mm -hmm. including family and, you know. I, and I had a brother and a sister and for a long time I was the biggest embarrassment in their lives because I was thinking and talking differently to them. And it, it was very hard, but the impulse to write, the impulse to be, you know, you go into a courtroom, and they say, hold up your hand, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, it's a big moment when you have to, when in fact that moment comes along in your life. When a moment to hold up your hand and say, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And that was the imp what I had to do at that time in South Africa. But I was scared of the mafia because they can shoot me down as soon as I got out of the courtroom. I mean, you know, mafia, South Africa. The apartheid government, yeah, you know, just using a metaphor. But uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can tell me how I, I how I did it. I don't know. I, I really, truly don't. I mean, uh, I mean, you could have written and just like kept your stuff to yourself, but you chose to. So there was obviously that fear, but you still went went against it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> now, please, I'm, I'm, I'm totally respectful of your question, and I hope that none of you ever have to deal with this, an issue like that. Um, and the way to deal with it is what I said right at the outset of talking to you. Realize that you are the future of this country. And as I said to the SRC, if it goes wrong, I'm going to come back and blame all of you. <laughs> yes. Um, I actually, first I just want to comment on that, and then I have another question. Um, I was just wondering, right in the beginning, you were talking about love. Is it not perhaps a deep understanding of love that then compelled you to to um, actually send the, your writings out? Because I mean, if if I look at love, I look at a, a deeper definition of choice as well. Of, you know, of choice when you when you love someone or a nation or something, and that's the love for your nation in South Africa it. seems to be yeah. your evidence. Yeah. So, so the compulsion, yes, love, yeah, I, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but tell me, you said you also had a, oh, is that the question? Oh, no, no, the, the question I have actually um, is in terms of the fact if I look back in my life, um, just the five years of, that I've been at the university has completely almost changed the way I see life and the way I see people um, because of how I grew up. But looking back now and um, still, you know, kind of interacting with family and friends that don't have the same views of, of fairness for humanity and all of that, um, it's very challenging to actually to be in that situation and also to understand them and to understand that it's almost a blindness. They cannot see it. Like you... You don't know how you got to that place where you could see things differently. Um, but I wonder, how do you deal? You must deal with um, probably this kind of opposition of opinion even more so because of your standpoint. How do you deal with that? <clears throat> Remain the great advice that, who is it that in, it's in, um, it's in Hamlet. Unto thine own self be true. Hello. Who? Hello. Thank you very much. Unto thine own self be true. And can you complete the quotation? For uh, then, uh, as night... Uh, uh, yes, I know. But uh, uh, unto thine own self be true. You know, there's nothing... You know, betraying a friend is awful. You know, to betray someone who, you, who trusts you or loves you. To betray yourself infinitely worse. Infinitely worse. Now you seem to be in touch with, and I'm not trying to give you advice, but no, because you've spoken very beautifully and very tellingly and very honestly, but you seem to be in touch with the core of 
real rock solid decency in yourself right now, just stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. There are situations where they can, people are going to say this and people are going to say that, where it will in fact be better that you just keep, keep quiet. Then there are going to be situations where you can't. You know, and you're going to have to work that one out for yourself. There's no rule that you can follow. But, um, yeah. Okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Third question. Um, I want to ask your opinion on how far you think we have come in this country since the 90s, the early 90s. Not in terms of... Not in terms wow. of... You know, how... We, how like, well, how the policies have changed. I'm, I'm asking in terms of love, in terms of our capacity to love our fellow citizens, irrespective of who they are. Sorry, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you how far do you think we've come in this country? Yes, I've heard that first part yes. since, let's say, 94, when yes. we all stood in queue and yes. voted for our first ever. Yes. And, and not in terms of which political party is now in power, uh -huh. but, but in terms of our capacity to love our fellow citizens. Oh, well, you, you know, let's start with one simple fact. In the South Africa I grew up in, I couldn't have assembled a group of young people such as I'm talking to now, and basically I think I would think that I'm going to assume, I wonder if anybody would be would be courage, courageous enough to hold up their hand and say, I don't agree with you and all your talk about love. I've got a feeling that all of you subscribe to what I'm saying. Now that is a very big, big movement to go from a situation where sometimes you have to whisper. You have to whisper. And not talk loudly as the way we are talking, unashamedly asking any question we like. Oh no, 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 don't for one moment think that that man's 27 years in Robben Island, you know who I'm talking about, were wasted. No, no. The achievement is real, but it's imperative that you guard it. You know, you guard it and keep pushing it forward because the injustice inherited from the past but it's true of all Africa, of course, and it's colonial history. The injustice that, 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 we, that, that, that characterized the old is still with us in the new. You know, there's just been a famous march that has been led by Julius Malema, which ostensibly is about, you know, about a, a march against poverty, which is still rampant in, it, rampant in our country. Rampant. You know? And we have to live with the contradiction of seeing somebody eat sushi off the naked body of a woman. Well, you remember that incident if you didn't. You know, somebody who had a lot of money did that. The same person also sort of, I think, had a bath in champagne. Now, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't gone all the way in answer to your question. But we have traveled. We have traveled. I wouldn't be here talking to you now if we hadn't. Yes? Um, I have two questions. The, the first one is, if you say you are a hybrid South African, why did you decide to write in English? Um, and then the second question um, is about your, the play you wrote about the road to Mecca, which was inspired by the life of the Marcus. And I was just interested to know, um, how did you come to follow a story and what inspired you to write this? Okay, let me answer the first question. Uh, do you know that he's, he's dead now, but he was a very, very good friend of mine, the Afrikaans writer Jan Rabi? Now, Jan had for me Jan said to me one day, we were <laughs> camping in the Otanikwa Mountains, climbing, <laughs> and Jan said to me, Ethel, Yera, what make you your man? You know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you have translated your plays before you wrote them. 
Meaning that those plays should have been written in English, in Afrikaans in the very first place and then translated into English, not the other way around, which is what, what happens now with my plays. Um, well, you know, this was an issue which we debated one of our overstuffed lunches at Stias, <laughs> residence at the moment. We, we debated the question of translation. The Italians have a very good phrase, traduttore, traditore, which means translator, traitor. You know that there is no way you can carry the truth of one language over into the other language. And you betray the work, the original work. Get them to learn to speak whatever the language of the original was. And we were debating this and then a man who's become a very good friend of mine, a professor of theology, is also meditating up there in Stios and getting fatter by the day. We're <laughs> <laughs> all putting on weight. <laughs> uh, he said to the assembled, there were about ten of us around the table, and he said, you know, because we also talked about Herman Charles Bosman, who is also a, a writer who wrote wonderful stories in, in about South Africa and about Afrikaners, but in English. And this professor, his name is Vincent Brummer, a professor of theology, he said, well, you know, I must correct you all. These writers who you're talking about, like Fugard and Bosman and others, they, they wrote their plays in Afrikaans in the very first instance. It's just that they used English words. <laughs> Do you see how... Now, there's a very real truth hidden in that little nugget, and I value him having said it. But to answer your question up there, uh, one of the things I'm doing at Stias is writing my first Afrikaans play. This is my yes to Tunyal stick in Afrikaans. And... Um, I'm glad to hear you're still writing. That's all it matters. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and then the road to Mecca. Now, what was it you wanted to know about the road to Mecca? I was just interested uh, in how you came about the story and why you decided to write about it. Okay. I'll tell you why I, how I came about the story is that I was traveling around back roads of South Africa once and I came across this little village in the Karoo, Grafrenet district, a place called New Bethesda. And when I discovered it, there were about, I would say, 20 white people left in the village and four, five hundred brown colored people living in the location, Pinarsuch. But it was a dead, dead little village. And I, the ship, for example, it had once been a very thriving little village, the center of a lively Afrikaans, of farming community. But when I found it, half, three quarters of the houses, there's only two roads through it, but the, three quarters of all those houses, lovely solid crew houses, were being used to, uh, for sheep at night. Sheep were herded into them because the nights get very cold up there. That is, that is how the, this village was dying. And I discovered I could buy a little house, which I did and still own, for virtually next to nothing. And so I bought it. And then at first the, 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 uh, the locals would have nothing to do with me. Nothing at all. But it's like that in all small communities. There's always suspicion when the, when the stranger comes in. Especially when, as one Afrikaans woman put it to another Afrikaans woman, talking about me, Yer waro maak hy homself so as pris lelik. Why does he make himself so deliberately ugly? Oh, thank you. <laughs> but the truth is, in this village, I quickly discovered, there was a crazy old woman who had defied the convention and the authority of the Dutch Reformed Church minister by stopping going to church and by making statues, making idols into which she, 
she prayed, no doubt, on moonlit nights or something. You know, the sort of way the popular imagination plays with. And I discovered she was still alive. Helen Martins was the lady's name. And I saw her incredible creation for the first time. But she had suffered so long and so severely from os being ostracized by these people around her, right around her, and um, that she wanted nothing to do with strangers. So, although I made a tentative approach to her, she would wanted nothing more to do. She didn't want to know me, didn't want to know me. And um, that was the end of it, I thought. Um, then she committed suicide, terrible, terrible death. She drank caustic soda, lie, you know, and burnt away her insides. It's a terrible way to go. But her hands were so crippled from her work on her cement statues that she couldn't even hold a razor blade and maybe try to cut her wrist or something like that. So she drank poison. And the only poison she could get hold of was caustic soda. And believe me, that is not the way you want to go. Not at all. And so that was that. But then, the, because I lived there, and because I started to write a few newspaper articles about New Bethesda, people began to discover it. And one thing led to another, and that sleepy little village slowly began to wake up. People came there to buy holiday homes. It, it became a real little lively village again. Still basically separated, you know, white, colored, white, colored, white, black, black, colored. Uh, but anyway, and I, I, I couldn't find, you know, when I look for a story I want to tell, a play I want to write, it's like there's got to be a kind of an energy in it that will move the story forward. I've got, I've got to feel that it's, it's urgent. I've got to feel a sense of urgency, and I couldn't, I couldn't find it in her story. Even though she had suffered and gone through everything and what have you, I, 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 I just, I just, oh no, it wasn't there. Anyway, so she commits suicide, and then many years later, here in Cape Town, I'm at a small social party, and a young woman comes up to me. I'd heard that Miss Helen had had one friend in her old age, <coughs> just one, a young woman from Cape Town. At this party, a young woman comes up to me and says, I want to thank you for writing about the village and about Miss Helen's statue because um, I knew her and we had a very good relationship and uh, you, you have contributed to people realizing that she was a good artist. And then as a little memento of meeting her and as an expression of gratitude to me, she gave me a little photograph. And in the photograph, you see Miss Helen. She, Miss Helen was small, small little bird-like woman. And she's standing there looking, you know, with, with, with pretended uh, fear and anxiety at this young strapping young, strong young woman who's looking down at her as if she's going to spank her bottom, you know, for being naughty or something like that. It's just a photograph that the way you would play when you're having a photograph taken. These two women played with a moment, pretending to be frightened, pretending to be strong and severe. But what is important about that photograph is that you are looking at trust and love. And I, the moment I saw that photograph, I knew these two women not only trusted each other, they love each other. It's, 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 it's so, it was there. And that started me thinking that it was time, in fact, to write the play. What really got me going, well, not got me going, I then started to write the play, but what added impetus to my first efforts to explore this situation was that I realized it gave me an opportunity to do something that I've always puzzled about. 
you know, we talk lightly and loosely about a creative energy. And what I've, I've often thought about is, where does it come from? How do we handle it? And what consequences are there in terms of having an energy? In other words, at one level, that play, which, and I'm very proud of that play, and it goes into rehearsal in New York in a Broadway theatre in about one week's time. The Road to Mecca. Well, I realised that it gave me a chance to deal with the enigma of creativity. Because, you know, it's the nearest we come to being gods is that we have the mysterious power in us, whether you're a poet, a painter, or a novelist, or a playwright, of transforming some experience of yours into something that will affect people, change their lives. That's, that's a very mysterious, when I mean, you come to think of it, how does that work? Can any of you exactly explain how that works? I can't. At the age of nearly 80, I still don't understand, but I, I explored that issue in The Road to Mecca. And I'm just trying to see, there was one other point I wanted to mention in that connection. Oh yes, no, no, because it, at that level is so personal to me, I've often described Miss Helen as Ethel Fugard in drag. <laughs> <laughs> and can I tell you something? I'd love to play that role. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know. How are we doing for time? We're fine. We're fine? Oh, yes, we're still fine. Okay, come on. Yes, thank you. Keep your audience on their seats 
from a technical perspective. How do you, how do you get to work? Yeah, I've been talking to you for non-stop for about an hour and a half already. Mm. I like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've had you, you've asked a question. Um, I think that the, 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 the,